All right, everyone, here we are, yet again, another lecture in our series in world history. Today we're going to look at uh, the kingdom of ancient Israel along the Levantine coast, the Levant uh, of the eastern Mediterranean that would connect Mesopotamia to Egypt. So we'll look at the position of Israel first, its geographic position that we see here. Uh, Mesopotamia we see up here uh, to the northeast and down to the southwest, Egypt. Uh, this might be a bit of an overstatement of the extent uh, of the kingdom of, of Israel. It tended to be a little bit more in this region right in here. Of course, you have the great Arabian desert out here and the sea over here, so this is really the only kind of this narrow strip of land is, um, is the only area that's really inhabitable in this area. To the north, their neighbors were the city-states of the Phoenicians, who we've already had a look at, uh, Sidon and Tyre in particular. Um, and of course, there was a relationship with ancient Egypt that we'll see, uh, and the Babylonians and Assyrians, who will be attacking uh, Israel throughout much of their history. This is a very strategic location, um, particularly between these two major empires to the northwest and to the south, excuse me, the northeast and the southwest, these, um, these empires were often in conflict with one another, and the uh, link between the two of them, the, the route, uh, ran, ran straight through Israel. So dominance of that region was strategically important both to the Egyptians and to the Mesopotamians. It was also an important uh, region in terms of trade routes between um, those uh, two larger civilizations. Uh, and therefore, the kingdom of Israel could become quite wealthy as a result of, uh, of their facilitating trade and, uh, and managing the trade routes successfully. Historical understandings of, of the history of Israel um, are known through the religious text that we call the Torah. Okay, some people call it the Hebrew Bible, but the most appropriate name is Torah. Um, these are the books that are credited to, um, to Moses, having written by Moses. Most likely, um, though, that is a little bit too early. Um, the probable dating of Moses anywhere from 1200 to 1400 BCE is too early for a written religious text. And so, therefore, if there is any attribution back to Moses, it was as the orig uh, originator of the oral tradition of the Hebrew Torah. And then uh, centuries later, it would have been written down. And that's virtually with any text um, of great antiquity. How long did it survive as an oral, in the oral tradition, and then at what point is it written down? And how are changes or alterations made as it moves from an oral tradition to a written text? But that's how we know much about the, the history of ancient Israel. Um, they describe the descendants of one individual, Abraham of Ur. Ur was in Mesopotamia. Uh, <coughs> and then who settles in the region that we saw on the map, um, uh, a slide earlier, between the Syrian desert and the Mediterranean. Abraham, uh, Abraim, as he was first, um, or Abram, as he was first called, um, and his descendants would worship the one God who had a name, Yahweh. Uh, it was the unspeakable name of God. And we only know it for its consonants in Hebrew and not any of the vowels because Hebrew uh, is a language that does not have vowels, only a tradition of inserting vowels into its consonant alphabet. In the time period of the most, the most ancient origins of, of Israelite or uh, Hebrew history, um, these were largely semi-nomadic peoples. They um, moved with their flocks from season to season, but in one general area. So they, you know, not like the nomads of the, of the Paleolithic era who would move and never really settle in one place at all. Uh, but these folks would have pasture regions for their... Uh, for their descendants, uh, for their for their animals, and settled largely in northern um, northern and eastern Egypt. Uh, that's where most of their settlements had been. Which begs the question of the earliest Hebrew 
uh, stories, which is the Exodus, um, when for a time the Israelite people were sold into slavery by the Egyptians. They eventually became enslaved by Egyptians. Story according to the Torah says that Moses and his brother Aaron, under the instructions from Yahweh, led the people of Israel out of slavery into the land that God had promised them, which was Canaan, which happens around 1250 BCE, thereabout, plus or minus 100 years. Um, probably more like... Sorry about that. Probably more, uh, probably more like um, uh, 1350 BCE. So it's a little on the earlier side, if anything. So the question then becomes, you know, were, was this an actual exodus? Did they pick up and leave Egypt? Or, as some modern archaeologists seem to suggest, um, did they actually really rebel against the Egyptians? Had, in a sense, the Israelite people been part of the kingdom of Egypt as maybe in a subservient capacity, and what is described in the ancient Hebrew texts is not so much a leaving, but a breaking away from the uh, Egyptian rule. Uh, and that's, that's a, a different answer and, and to, to the problem. It, it certainly ignores much of the way in which the Israelite people have described themselves in terms of their history. Um, sorry, anyway, um, as, as we said, that it does ignore much of what the texts uh, say about the Israelite people. So we have to, we have to look back and forth at the archaeological evidence for the written word. Um, another aspect of, of for, for which that argument was maintained was because if you look at the battles that are fought um, as the Israelite people are rebelling uh, or are, are entering into the promised land, the battles don't seem to have a rhyme or reason to them. They seem to be all over the place. Uh, this is why archaeologists have suggested that it looks much more like spontaneous uprisings uh, happening around the same time back and forth rather than a, a, con uh, a, a, a war of conquest in which it would move in and take city by city by city until the whole land had been subdued. Um, once they had established themselves as, as independent, um, having left Egypt or rebelled against it, uh, they established their law. Um, when they had encamped, on, according to the Torah, on their way out of Egypt, they encamped uh, at Mount Sinai, where Moses had gone up on the mountain and spoken to God, and there received from God, Yahweh, the Ten Commandments. And these were essentially the, the uh, origin of, of Hebrew law, which would be expanded uh, in the course of Levitical law and Deuteronomy, um, the other books of Moses, into uh, a, a rather extensive list of laws for this people, and a people that had recently been slaves. So in, in one way, you can look at it as the rules by which free people live with one another. So these ten rules define relationships between individuals. Uh, in the community, as well as between individuals and what their relationship with God should be like. So they are a religious law. Um, collectively, these laws form the basis of a promise relationship, okay, or covenant, between Yahweh and his chosen people, Israel. And the importance of covenant will come back again and again and again and again and again. Um, in order to maintain this relationship, uh, the people of Israel have to follow uh, the divine law. If they break the law, they're acting against that covenant relationship, that promise that is made between them and God. And it's also interesting, it's the promise is made before the law even comes into being. So it's not like they had a, uh, according to their, their religious text, um, they promise to obey God's law, and then God tells them what the law is. Um, so it is... Uh, Again, it was the law that seals the relationship. After many years of living as a kind of tribal confederation that had conquered the land of Canaan, the kingdom of Israel is established under three uh, seminal monarchs. Um, the reign of King Saul from 
1020 to about 1000 BCE, David for about the 40 year period after that, and David's son Solomon in the next 40 years. Now, the numbers here are very, are very neat, especially when we look at David and Solomon, 40 years. 40 years in, in biblical language or, or in, in, in Hebrew storytelling means a long time, or it means a generation. So for a generation, King David ruled. For a generation, Solomon ruled. Uh, the exactitude in terms of dates are very difficult when we're talking about such uh, early history. Um, so the kingdom is established. Now, after Solomon's time, we'll see that the kingdom divides in along different lines. Okay. But what's important about the kingdom of Israel is that the is the is the person of the king. The way the ancient Hebrews tell the story, the, the king and the king's family, having a king who is a descendant of David sitting on the throne is so crucially important to them. Because God's, uh, God's chosen descendant from David is called Masiach. Okay. Um, we, would, we would call this Messiah. It is the anointed one, the one whom God calls his son, who is the human ruler of God's chosen people, Israel. It's important to note that in this context, the Messiah the one whom God would call his son, is not divine, but is in fact a human being who has entered into service of this God and rules according to God's law. Okay? So there's a lot of theology of, of, of God speak, if you will, that surrounds the person of the king. And we've seen that, um, for instance, in ancient uh, Egypt, which, which we have not talked much about, in Egypt, the Pharaoh was, in a sense, a reincarnation of, the, uh, of a god. In ancient Mesopotamia and Assyria, for instance, the ruler, the Lugal, was the chief priest of the people and, and interceded on behalf of the people with the gods. Here in Israel, the king is supposed to rule in the name of God, is chosen by God to rule. And we will see that again and again and again. Western European uh, nations, for instance, <clears throat> will pick up on this, and the idea of divine right of kings will be very much based upon the, the justification for the rule of, uh, of kings in ancient Israel. King Solomon was the last ruler to govern the United Kingdom, uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, and he is responsible for constructing the great temple um, to Yahweh in the capital of, of David, which was Jerusalem. Jerusalem was not one of the original cities that was conquered by David uh, or by the Israelite people. It came much later. Uh, it was the city of the Jebusites. Um, Solomon also, and the, the model of that temple, by the way, is what we see uh, on the first, the opening slide of this lecture. Um, it will become the model for a lot of other uh, religious architecture that will take place, especially in Europe, in uh, the succeeding generations. Uh, Solomon also establishes major trade links throughout the Near East and the Red Sea regions, all the way down to um, what is today modern, modern Ethiopia. Um, there is the record of the, uh, the visitation of the Queen of Sheba to the court of Solomon. Now, Sheba was a colony of Ethiopia, or Abyssinia, uh, in the southern Arabian Peninsula. So, clearly, uh, the Israelites are, are experiencing a time of great prosperity in which they're establishing uh, diplomatic relationships quite far beyond their own borders. When Solomon dies, the kingdom splits in two. The northern kingdom is called Israel. In the south, it is called Judah. In between 721 and 722 BCE, the Assyrians, who we've already encountered, um, destroyed the northern kingdom and deported all of its inhabitants. In other words, it took, took the, the inhabitants of the northern um, <clears throat> ten tribes and spread them out around the Assyrian Empire, uh, really never to be heard by Shav again. 
<clears throat> as a result, <clears throat> uh, and as we've mentioned in class, the cultural heritage, the monotheism um, that, that we find in ancient Hebrew religion was retained within the southern kingdom of Judah. And as a result of that, because it's the specific brand of Yahweh worship that was known in Judah, it was centered on the temple, it was centered on the Davidic monarchy. Um, because of all that, we don't call this Yahwism, we don't call it Israelitism, we call it Judaism, the religion of the kingdom of Judah. And that's what really ends up shaping this particular cultural and religious tradition. In 587 BCE, uh, Calamity also befalls the kingdom of Judah. Uh, another conqueror from Mesopotamia, this time not the Assyrians, but now the Babylonians, uh, are on the warpath. Um, the Neo-Babylonian Empire, a successor to the Assyrians in that region. In 587, the Babylonian kingdom conquers Judah and deposes the, the last descendant, um, of David. Uh, many Jewish people were deported in this time. They were sent from, from Jerusalem to Babylon. But what's unique in this instance is while they are in Babylon, they, they retain their own sense of community, their own sense of identity, of national identity. And at a certain time, they will be returned to Israel. So they will survive, and their traditions will also survive. This marks the beginning of what is called the Jewish diaspora. Diaspora is a word that you should remember. Um, it means scattering. Uh, and there is a diaspora of, Jew of the Jewish population that is now, will, at this point, will be scattered all around the ancient Middle East, from northern Egypt to um, the islands off the, in the Mediterranean, to the Israelite coastline, to down the Red Sea, um, to Babylon, and will soon spread to Greece, and so on. And for a very small population, they would then establish links, contacts, with other Jewish communities and other cities far around the eastern Mediterranean. And then their contacts will spread around the western Mediterranean to the city of Rome, when it establishes. And so one way to move in and through these Jewish communities is, um, uh, or to move around the Mediterranean, is, is to be Jewish, uh, is to uh, have those, those contacts throughout the Mediterranean world. Um, it will mean, also, since Christianity emerges as a sect of Judaism, it will spread very quickly around the Mediterranean through all of those Jewish city-states, uh, or those Jewish communities in all those Mediterranean city-states. So the exile period lasts from about 587 all the way down to the middle of the 400s, uh, when finally, under the Persians, um, uh, under the Persians, the uh, Jewish people would be resettled in their homeland. And they would stay there for the next 400 years until the Romans uh, would take control of that region and would face several major Jewish uprisings. The... Um, the, uh, the Jewish uprising in the late 60s of the Common Era would eventually mean that the uh, Jewish people would be expelled from Palestine until the late 1940s, when the kingdom, when the state of Israel would be reestablished following World War II. An overview of the beliefs and customs of the Israelite people. Uh, the Jewish people. It's based on the belief, as we've said, in obedience to the one God, Yahweh. Um, traditional Judaism required adherence to, um, adherence to observe strict dietary laws. Um, that's sometimes observed uh, in the 21st century, sometimes not. But much of the Hebrew law uh, has to do with dietary codes. Uh, and what is a proper and not proper to eat. There is an enforcement of a no-work rule on the Sabbath, which is Saturday, uh, because of the creation story that we will be reading in class. Um, some 21st century Jews observe this, some do not. Okay. 
Um, those who would be considered themselves more orthodox, sort of stricter form of contemporary Judaism, would in fact observe this rule, while others might not. Uh, of their many festivals, two are of great importance, Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, uh, in which uh, uh, people of the Jewish faith will beseech God to forgive them for their sins, um, and the Passover, uh, which commemorates their movement, their flight from uh, Egypt, uh, and and the very the very plain meal that they had to have as they were ready to leave Egypt uh, and escape slavery. Uh, there are other, many other festivals. There, there are New Year, Rosh Hashanah. There are harvest festivals. There's the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles. There's all sorts of, 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 of observances. Uh, but what's most important about it probably is that it, it happens largely in the home. Um, worship in synagogues is, is important. That's what you would do um, uh, when you gather with other members of, of the religion. But uh, and, and the animal sacrifice that had been characteristic of worshipping in the temple has been abandoned. They don't sacrifice animals and so forth in, uh, in, in synagogue worship today. It's a different type of Judaism than what was practiced uh, before the destruction of the temple uh, in and around 70 AD. But much of what goes on in Judaism happens in the home. Uh, uh, the Sabbath is observed at home. The Passover meal is observed at home. Uh, it is very much a religion that, that penetrates very deeply into every aspect of daily life uh, and is not, shall we say, an extraordinary religious experience, but one that seeks to s suffuse or be a part of all of the ordinary aspects of life, uh, honoring their God in that sense. And on that note... We will end this lecture. Um, thank you all very much, and have a great day.